1885. Amazing. I actually end up as a blacksmith in the old west. Pretty heavy, huh? I think every time that we were talking about Back to the Future, the opportunity was there to explore a different genre. And there's very few movie-making experiences I can think of where you really totally get the opportunity to do that because we're dipping into science fiction and then dipping into an action adventure and then trying something that was a full-blown Western. And you're inside of storytelling that Bob was doing where anything goes. Have you ever seen a western? Yeah, I have, Doc. And Clint Eastwood never wore anything like this. When I did it, I realized why so many directors enjoyed doing westerns, because it's kind of like camping out. You know, you're there, it, you know, and it was always quiet. Doing a western is quiet. And the reason it's quiet is there's no vehicles. All the base camp is way far away, and you know, the actors are run up to the settings, electric golf carts, so all you have are these horses. It's nice and quiet, it's peaceful. Yeah, it was great. I mean, I'd go fishing almost every day when I wasn't working and, and, and just to rattle around the sets. And, and again, you have things you have to do, whether it's uh, you know work with a quick dry expert with the guns or whether it was take horseback riding lessons and, and figure out how to handle a horse next to the train and all that stuff. So there's always stuff to do, but then the moments of peace were really peaceful. Bob and I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and the Western was a staple of television. We loved Westerns, and I think shooting Back to the Future 3 was probably the most fun I've had shooting any movie, because I got to go to work wearing a cowboy hat. And then to go to Monument Valley and walk in John Ford's footsteps, that was movie heaven. And we stayed at uh, Goulding's Lodge, where John Ford and John Wayne used to stay. It was just the best. Okay, let's shoot. When someone says, I want this to be like a John Ford movie, they don't usually say, I want you to actually go into Monument Valley and shoot. Then let's say they say they want you to shoot. That's great. But to build a drive-in theater in Monument Valley, where you see the buttes that are actually reflected in the big mural, which has all the Indians charging, and then send the DeLorean straight at it so that when it hits 88 miles per hour, that will all disappear. And of course, come right into an Indian charge. Indian! Action, Michael. You've been asleep for nearly six hours now. I love doing westerns, and I loved doing an Irish accent. It was really, really fun. That town that they built was amazing. I remember going um, for the first time to the set and like kind of going over a hill, and it was an entire city that they had created. We built everything on site. There was nothing done in the west that was not a part of that town. So all the interiors that you see are interiors with exteriors. So it, after a very short time, felt like a real town. And then parts we didn't even finish because that was part of the look of the movie. I thought the Western parts of Back to the Future 3 were as good as some of the scenes in My Darling Clementine. The bar, for instance, the, 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 just the production design of that bar. It was large, it was audacious, it was the way those saloons really were back in the 19th century. And I just thought that Western could challenge any other Western that had ever been made without time travel. And action! That was really fun, I mean, to be able to be a filmmaker and just order up an 1880s town is fantastic. And we built that entire western town, right where that train track was. That's it! How fast did she go? Well, I've had her up to 55 myself. There is one operating steam locomotive west of the Rockies, 
and that is in Jamestown, California, up near Sonora. And in the original skateboard chase in part one, there was a gag where Marty got away from Biff, not with a manure truck, but by skateboarding in front of an oncoming train, and the train cuts off Biff's car from getting across the tracks and going after him. So we actually scouted this area uh, and that train for that sequence, which for budget reasons we couldn't do. So we were familiar with the fact that there was this train up there. And the location was very picturesque, just beautiful area. Marty, I gave you explicit instructions not to come here, but to go directly back to 1985. I know, Doc, I had to come. But it's good to see you, Marty. All good drama needs a character arc. The characters need to grow, they need to change. And one of the challenges of doing Back to the Future 2 and 3 was to give Marty a place to go because the first movie was really about George's character arc and his change. Are you okay? So we had to give Marty this weakness that nobody calls me chicken. Are you chicken? And use that as an element and as his problem that's gonna get solved. Nobody calls me yellow. And we needed Doc to have an arc as well. And we thought, wouldn't it be interesting if in the third movie, Doc and Marty change places? Great Scott. I know, this is heavy. That Doc becomes the more irresponsible character because he has fallen in love and wants to stay with his true love and not give a damn about the space-time continuum. And Marty is the voice of science and reason. You're a scientist. So you tell me, what's the right thing to do up here? Love finds Doc Brown. And it was great that Doc had his turn in having an emotional story. And the fact that he became just struck down like a lovesick puppy. And that was getting in the way of the plot and getting back to the present. Wherever you go and take me with you. I can't, Clara. I wish it didn't have to be this way, but just believe me when I tell you that I'll never forget you. And that I love you. My kids had really been fans of the original film and turned me on to it. I really loved it. I loved the magic of it. And having done a time travel movie, my second film, Time After Time, was a time travel movie. So I already loved the genre. We didn't have a second choice. We didn't know who to go to if she said no. And the three of us were thinking, God, please let her say yes. Please let her say yes, because if she says no, what do we do? I remember Stephen telling me that they were very nervous that I would say no. I don't recall ever contemplating saying no, so I don't know what they were so nervous about. I was excited to work with all of them, but it's funny and I guess a little flattering that they thought they had to woo me. <laughs> and Chris Lloyd had been in my first film, Going South, so I already loved Chris. It wasn't a long walk to pretend like I adored him. I loved it. First of all, I love working with Mary Steenburgen. Good evening. Evening. We worked before, and I just felt it was perfectly cast, you know, great chemistry. And it's like Doc discovering another world. I don't think he ever thought about it relationships or women and he's thinking about space travel and all his other experiments and it was just a shock. You've read Jules Verne. I adore Jules Verne. So do I. I loved the idea of two kind of geeks because both of us are, are geeks. I'm someone who reads Jules Verne and who studies the stars and who's interested in some of the same things that he's interested in. So it's before there became such a thing in movies, kind of geek love. Well, the future, oh, I can tell you about the future. That's the thing about Chris again. He's a classically trained actor. He's a serious guy and knows how to get to the heart of a character. And so I think he just loved having that chance with Doc to, to take him to that vulnerable place and to have him kind of baffled by things that he couldn't explain through science or through trial and error, that he had to take risks of the heart. An interesting part about the transition between Back to the Future 2 and 3 was for Christopher Lloyd, because up till then he was the eccentric, crazy old man. But now we have to look at him a little different in part 3. 
Now we have to think of him as a love interest for a relatively young lady that was of quite a bit younger than him in look. I treasured working with the great costume designer Joanna Johnston. We were both very inspired, as was Bob Zemeckis, by John Ford's movies, and we wanted to create in Clara a heroine that had some of the romance of John Ford's heroines. And it was also important that I be able to move in, and I loved what she came up with. I wanted her to stand out and be very kind of heroic, and it was a very particular color in that period, that extraordinary sort of vibrant violet purple and my idea was that she would have be this sort of wonderful ping of uh, optimism and color and vibrancy I suppose really but the other thing that happened is that when she started the journey of that sequence in the dress the sun in Sonora was so hot that the dress started fading it started taking this sort of pinkish hue and we had to keep on making more dresses to complete the sequence because it, it was awful it literally changed colors in front of our eyes Experiment. One of the things I realized when I was doing the Back to the Future 3 was why filmmakers love doing movies about trains. Because the thing that's really great about a train is it's on a track. So to create action, tension, and suspense, there's one thing that the filmmaker doesn't have to spend a lot of time explaining to the audience, which is where the train is going. Because it's always going to be on the track. So to create a giant sequence at the end with a train, is a filmmaker's dream. I'll say, Doc, Doc, you know, come in. He'll listen to his walkie-talkie, and I'll lift it up, and I'll say, we're going at, a, at a 25 miles an hour. Okay, we're cruising at a steady 25 miles an hour, Doc. Damn it! My father was a freight train conductor, so trains are very important to me. Toby, I'm going to tell you this guy. <laughs> And I love to ride. I'm actually a little better rider now than I was when we did Back to the Future 3, although that is me riding up to the back of the train and touching it. <laughs> My stunt double did the transfer, but I trained pretty hard to be able to do that. <laughs> Steve Golly at that time was at the top of his game as a model maker. And model making was an incredibly useful and necessary craft in trying to turn these fantasies into reality. And so actually shooting the miniature set of the train flying off the cliff at the end of the movie was spectacular. And I actually remember I was on one of the cameras because they ran out of operators. So what it was is we went to this uh, hillside, Marin, close to where ILM was, and they laid a beautiful miniature track. And in fact, the train itself was pretty large scale. And I just couldn't believe that here was this beautiful train and one shot we're gonna blow the thing up. So, you know, we sent that thing off the cliff and just prayed that no one missed the shot and that everything worked properly, which it did. <laughs> I loved all the characters in Back to the Future. What's wrong? We thought you went to the lake. You wore that to the lake? And Wendy Jo Sperber, just a wonderful, wonderful actress, a firecracker of an actress. She sort of is our good luck charm. We want to put her in all of our movies, but in Back to the Future, too. But she was pregnant at the time, and she couldn't do the part, and we saved Wendy for the very end of Back to the Future 3. But it was just a tragic loss that, uh, that, that Wendy uh, had breast cancer and uh, left the world too soon. Her spirit lives on through her foundation, the We Spark Foundation, and it's a terrific charity for the families of cancer victims. Wendy was a happy, happy girl, big smile. You can close your eyes and just picture that smile, and she's... You know, it's, it's so cool, and it was nice to be able to cross paths with her in my lifetime, no doubt. I'm sure gonna miss him, Jen. A sequence like the train taking off at the end, you know, starts with the design, and so they designed this wonderful Jules Verne-like train, 
and we went and shot on this railroad crossing. That train had to be built from scratch. It's a shell, but all of the gizmos on it had to work. You know, the stairs, the door open. I think we had a Jeep inside of it that, that drove it down the tracks, and it was a huge build. It took us months to build that thing. And then, of course, when it takes off, Ken Ralston, uh, up at ILM at that time, would have to match it. So it was a carefully designed sequence with a wonderfully designed train that started practical and ended in the world of visual effects. I think at the end, we all felt a tremendous feeling of accomplishment. And we were proud of it. It worked. Come on, buddy! The actual thrill ride of the movie was there, and that was great. But it had a deeper thing. It had these characters and these relationships and these big questions, these kind of, you see, the Greeks have been asking these questions. I mean, these are old, big questions that we have, and, and it had humor, and it had so much going for it beyond just the visceral thrills. Your future is whatever you make it. So make it a good one, both of you. So I think that, you know, it's just a great coming together of, of a lot of different people and a lot of different talents that was just unique, and I, I don't think you'd find it today. The guys had a story in their brains that was rattling around up there, and they had to get it out. And they had two other stories, and that's all she wrote. And that's all there will ever be of Back to the Future. Enough is enough. Actually, I believe that just basically in the numerology of it, you know, there's tension in threes. Three, a three-act play. Four is not a dramatic number. Four is an even, calm, relaxed number. So I think three is the perfect amount of sequels that any movie should be done.